It's a wrap on the annual meeting of Canada's premiers, their last get-together before the federal election. Over the past two days, the provincial and territorial leaders tackled issues that are expected to dominate the fall campaign, including climate change, pipelines and trade, issues that also have created some friction between the provinces and the feds. Many issues were discussed uh, that require direction and leadership from the federal government. Of course, we all know there will be a federal election this fall. As premiers, we decided to seek clarity on the issues from, from the federal party leaders on behalf of Canadians. We will be sending a letter to all federal leaders asking, we sent a letter to all federal leaders asking a number of questions and we will make their responses public so that all Canadians can know where the federal party stand and, and can make an informed choice. So what kind of answers are the premiers seeking? Jason Kenney is the Premier of Alberta. He joins us now from Saskatoon. Hi, Premier Kenney. Great to see you again. Good to see you. Okay, so I know that you just received a whole lot of questions in that press conference about Quebec and oil and the stance on the pipeline. I want to ask you about that in a second, but I first want to pick up on something that came out of the communique released at the end of this meeting. Premiers are calling on the federal government to support emission credit trading across international borders, and this is all about carbon emissions. It's my understanding that for emissions credit trading to occur, for example, let's say Canada is exporting LNG to China, the two countries would have to negotiate and agree to that. How would you convince or how would you advise the federal government to adv uh, make sure that China actually does that? My understanding is that uh, Canada successfully obtained a provision in the Paris Convention, uh, Article 6, which creates a framework for uh, uh, credit to be given to countries that export technology that reduce carbon emissions. Uh, so, for example, Saskatchewan uh, produces um, uh, agricultural equipment that helps with zero tillage farming that creates carbon sequestration in agricultural practices or perhaps we would export carbon capture and storage uh, uh, technology or other kinds of technology uh, uh, so it would require bilateral agreements uh, that would give Canadian jurisdictions some credit against the uh, Paris targets uh, for sharing that technology. It would still require though that but like you use the word bilateral right it still necessitates that the country on the receiving end come to that agreement and so far even though that article exists that hasn't occurred yet do you have any confidence or how right. would you advise that the you know especially when you're talking about countries that are on the receiving end of these products right now like China for example how do you how do you get convince them to participate in that well, we're asking the federal government to help uh, clarify that. Uh, there, we don't want that Article 6 in the Paris Treaty to be a dead letter. Uh, it's there for a reason, uh, to recognize that we can help the developing world, for example, to reduce their carbon emissions, uh, but we should get some credit for when we do so. So um, I, I'm not a technical expert on this, but there is a belief that, uh, that you know, there's, a, there's the article is there, let's use it, let's get credit for it. Is it a way, though, critics might say, of abdicating our own responsibility or a province abdicating their responsibility? Is it a way of pushing it off to something else? Well, no. And in, in fact, uh, the whole international system around uh, greenhouse gas emissions is in part predicated on uh, on a transfer of credits. You know, the Russians, my goodness, at, at Kyoto in 1997, they got massive credit in terms of their international targets for the uh, ret retrospective for the deindustrialization of the Soviet Union that occurred 30 years ago. So surely we Canadians should get at least some credit for the stuff we do now that actually helps to reduce emissions. One way I've always pointed out that we could actually have a meaningful impact on global emissions would be to export more of our liquefied natural gas to help markets like China and India to convert their power production from high carbon coal to low, relatively low uh, carbon output uh, natural gas. Okay, let me switch topics. Let me ask you about what you were getting all those questions on. And it, it, it sort of stemmed from something you were asked last night about this idea about Quebec and the Premier of Quebec saying that there isn't social acceptability for oil or for an oil pipeline going through that province. Uh, you talked about the constitutional authority of the federal government and where infrastructure projects that cross provincial borders is concerned. I just want to make sure that we're clear and unequivocal here. Do you want the next government, whomever forms it, to force a pipeline through Quebec using under their own constitutional authority? That's not the language I would use. I, I was asked if I thought the federal government had that authority. And it's not a question of opinion. It's a question of clear, settled 
black on white constitutional law since 1867. Section 92 of the Constitution makes it very clear that interprovincial infrastructure projects are matters of exclusive nat uh, national federal jurisdiction. And that was confirmed very strongly and recently in a unanimous decision by the British Columbia Appeal Court in the reference brought by Premier Horgan. That's, he's appealing that uh, together, supported by Quebec to the Supreme Court of Canada, but the law here is not really in doubt. Now, there is no current private sector proponent of a Energy East-style pipeline, but uh, we believe there might be if we could provide regulatory certainty. That The lack of which certainty caused TransCanada to walk away after spending a billion dollars in six years on Energy East. So here's my point. The federal government's got to make it absolutely clear that no one province, including Quebec, has some imagined veto over a national infrastructure project of that nature. Do you, I, I take your point that they have the authority and that it's a hypothetical right now if, you were, if there was a proponent, but say there was, would you want the next government, who, whoever forms it, because we don't know at this point who will, would you want them to use that authority? Because having it and using it are two different things. If a proposal was made, uh, well, first of all, I think whoever the federal government is, the, here's, here's my contention with Justin Trudeau on this. Um, when Premier Higgs asked for the federal government to talk about reviving something like Energy East, uh, the, uh, Justin Trudeau said only if Quebec agrees. So he handed Quebec a unilateral veto over a, 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 a national infrastructure project that is the federal jurisdiction. That's our concern. We think he needs, he or any federal leader needs to walk that back, reassert clear federal paramountcy on a national infrastructure project. And then if a pro proponent comes along, like a pipeline company, and says, with the economics work, we'd like to try this again, the federal government would have to put it through the environmental assessment process. Quebec and other provinces could have their say. Ultimately, the regulator decides. That's ratified by the federal cabinet. So it's not an imposition. It's not like just a unilateral decision by the federal government. There is a clear process. But at the end of the day, it's the federal government say there's no provincial veto on that. Have you heard enough from Mr. Scheer on that? Because I've asked him the same question around using that authority where Quebec is concerned. And he has not been explicit either that he is willing to use it if Quebec is against a project that could come forward. Uh, Mr. Scheer and the federal conservatives clearly su uh, supported the Energy East process, uh, and I would expect him to do the same. Now, a federal government has to wait for an application to be made to go through the regulatory process before it can make a final decision. But neither Mr. Scheer nor Mr. Trudeau can amend the Canadian Constitution and start handing out vetoes to some provinces on uh, national infrastructure projects. But the, here's the broader point. This country was built because of an, a national infrastructure project called the Canadian Pacific Railway. The central Canadian economy was in part built around a, a interprovincial infrastructure project, the St. Lawrence Seaway, the hydroelectricity that, uh, for, of Quebec that has helped to fuel much of that province's modern prosperity is interprovincial infrastructure. So that's how we built this country. Let's uh, let's stop balkanizing ourselves. Uh, let's re reassert that that uh, na that. Be, that idea of being partners in prosperity through national infrastructure. And that's what we're getting at in our communique around the idea of economic corridors. Okay, I have to leave it there. I'm out of time. Thank you, Premier Kenny. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. I appreciate it. Justin Trudeau has failed this country when it comes to standing up for Buy America. What I've seen here over the last few days where Justin Trudeau has failed manufacturing companies, have failed the people of this country, we have a group of premiers that are willing to stand up and lead this nation to prosperity from coast to coast to coast. That was Ontario Premier Doug Ford at the closing press conference of the Council of the Federation in Saskatoon. Premiers Ford, Moe and Legault all raised the issue of Buy America provisions in the wake of Bombardier's decision to lay off hundreds of workers in Thunder Bay. The company says Buy America provisions were one of the factors that contributed to the layoffs. But as the premiers call on the feds to do more, what can Ottawa really do? And is there anything the provinces could also be doing on their own? Joining me now is Scott Moe, Premier of Saskatchewan. Hi, Premier Moe. Great to see you again. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Rashi. Let me start right there, Premier. I know that the ask at the table today was for the federal government to secure those exemptions, but is there any sort of active consideration on the part of your province being given to the idea of some kind of retaliatory, quote unquote, by Canada measure taken on your own? 
Uh, we, we had discussions with respect to, you know, what opportunities do, do the provinces have to, uh, to do things like that, which are totally against uh, the nature of uh, the majority, if not all, of the people sitting around the table. We do want to have, you know, open, uh, open uh, market access, uh, not only across our provinces and working very hard uh, towards that uh, through this meeting and, and previous meetings, but also across North America and around the world. Canada is an exporting nation always uh, does better when we have uh, that free and open uh, fair market access. So uh, we had, uh, what we did have uh, discussions around as to what premiers would be able to do with respect to this. We have the request of the federal government to engage on an exemption for Canada, but we can continue to, to advocate with our governors, our counterparts uh, in the Senate and the House uh, in, the, in the United States, uh, President Trump's uh, um, uh, cabinet members and we are uh, down there as premiers from time to time and we're going to continue to engage both uh, individually but also jointly as we did last year uh, Council of Federation delegation attended the National Governors Association meeting in, in, in Washington last year and we intend on uh, doing just that again this year. Do I take that, do I, do I sort of interpret that to mean that you view the role of premiers uh, sort of as advocacy and you don't you are not considering or you will not make a move to invoke something like a bi Canada provision uh, for the companies or the products in your province if we, if we start to invoke a bi Canada uh, position uh, one it goes the wrong way with respect to uh, trade uh, two uh, it, it'd be in violation of other trade uh, agreements that we have such as the CETA deal of which we also want to uh, ratify and uh, have uh, have European Union states ratify as well. So uh, this is a nation to nation conversation that needs to happen between the United States of America and and our nation of Canada. And the role of the premiers, the subnational governments, is uh, to advocate at their level, whether that be at the governors or the Senate or the House um, uh, in in the United States. We're going to do just that uh, jointly, uh, as well as individually with states of importance to specific provinces. Uh, but this, what we see here uh, this week is uh, the consequences of, of just uh, what impact this policy can have. I want to turn to trade and freer trade within this country and, and especially where the CFTA, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, is concerned. Uh, Jason Kenney yesterday right. announced that Alberta would be getting rid of a lot of the exemptions under that trade agreement. And that's been a big part of the problem about why it hasn't really been implemented to the degree that many say that it should be. Uh, you said you've committed to a review of those exemptions. Why didn't you go as far as Premier Kenney? Oh, and, and we, may, we may be in, in short order. The fact of the matter is, through the New West, New West Partnership, those exemptions are gone already for the four member uh, provinces of that. Through the CFTA, what we've identified is there is actually a, a slight challenge in the, in the trade agreement where in order to remove exemptions, you would need the approval of all of the, the partners at the table. What we moved forward here uh, through these meetings was that you can unilaterally, any province can remove their own exemptions or exceptions that they have, that they have put forward. Um, we made that change. Premier Kenny was the first uh, to move, removing, I think, about half of the exceptions that, uh, that the province of Alberta had. We also had a commitment by, uh, from all provinces and territories to uh, review uh, their, the exceptions that they have put forward with an eye to reducing and removing as many as possible. And that's the process that we're going through uh, as we speak. So my question, though, was why not do what Premier Kenny does, did and just unilaterally do that? Why do you need another review to figure out to what degree you're actually going to remove those exemptions? Uh, and we may move. We may move in much the same way that uh, Premier Kenny has. Um, we have been looking at these and we're going to continue to look at them over the short term. And you may very well see in the next number of days or weeks uh, that Saskatchewan will do something uh, very similar. You may, as you will see other provinces that may uh, also remove uh, some of the exceptions uh, that they have. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is we also uh, called on the federal government as they are a partner in the, uh, in the uh, CFTA agreement to, to review the exceptions uh, that they had brought to the table as well, brought to the agreement, if you will, because the entity with the largest number of exceptions in the CFTA FTA was the federal government and so all provinces are committing to a, a review of their exceptions with an eye to reducing those. Saskatchewan's moving very quickly on that. Alberta has already acted um, and we've asked the federal government to, uh, uh, to uh, move on just such a review and remove some of the exceptions that they had put forward as well. I just want to be clear though for our viewers that you are saying that you're going to act to remove those. It could be in a, is few, you know, as soon as a few days and I'm asking about the timeline for a specific reason because this promise of reducing barriers has been going on for a long time. It's come from many provinces. It's come from the federal government. And there has been a huge yeah. struggle in this country yeah. to actually accomplish that. So yeah. are you being unequivocal that yeah. you will be, be getting rid of those exemptions? Or is this a review that could go on for months and maybe years? 
Uh, no, not a review that will go on for months and maybe years. I won't commit until we uh, we get through uh, a short review, if you will, of the exceptions that we have uh, here in Saskatchewan. I believe there's nine of them, if I remember correctly. Um, we'll be uh, doing that review and where we can move, we'll be, we'll be moving uh, uh, as, as quickly as possible. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is in Western Canada, we, we enjoy actually the, the trade relationship from Manitoba West uh, through the, the New West Partnership. The New West Partnership, which does not have exceptions. And so with uh, about half of the nation, not quite, uh, four provinces, we actually uh, trade without exceptions already. Uh, so that, that is a positive. And I think uh, uh, in fairness, we're looking at uh, uh, talking to other provinces as well in, uh, in, with an eye of actually getting to that type of an environment where we don't have exceptions uh, between our province. So you may see um, not the growth of that, that agreement uh, per se, but the growth of the parameters of that gr agreement. Per se. I just watched the press conference that you and your counterparts held. You took a lot of questions, and especially Premier Legault and the Western Premiers took a lot of questions around the possibility of, a, of an east-west pipeline, uh, specifically around the, the idea of federal jurisdiction and what kind of jurisdiction the federal government has under the Constitution to push through a potential pipeline if it had to go through Quebec. Do you want the next government to exercise that constitutional authority should a pipeline be proposed that would go through Quebec? Do you want them to impose a pipeline on Quebec? If a pipeline is uh, is proposed, the federal government has a responsibility to consider that pipeline. It is their area of jurisdiction as per the Constitution. And so whoever is the leader of our nation after this fall's election does have the responsibility of actually uh, making the decision with with respect to, uh, you know, whether a pipeline is approved or not. It is not in the provincial jurisdiction. We're seeing uh, that exact uh, conversation playing out on our West Coast as uh, as, was, as it works its way through the, uh, the provincial court system, ultimately heading for the, the Supreme Court, we saw a, a, a unanimous uh, decision in the in the first court case there that said this actually is, uh, is in fact is uh, in the federal jurisdiction. That's what we have said uh, all along. In saying that, in saying that, uh, we did have good discussions around the table over the course of the past uh, three days here, um, with respect to although we have disagreements. Um, um, but with respect to how we can continue to work together to grow our economy, there were some very positive uh, discussions, discussions that did include uh, the conversation around economic corridors, if you will, for uh, electricity, for, for you know, mine products, uh, uh, um, but also for LNG and ultimately uh, oil products as well, not just east and west, but also the potential uh, for north and south and to unlock some of the access into the northern resources that we have in this nation. Really quickly, though, before I let you go, you heard Premier Legault as many times as I did in that press conference say there is no social acceptability for oil or for oil pipelines through Quebec. Realistically, do you envision a federal government of any stripe that will say, sorry, you may feel that way, but we're doing it anyway? Well, I, I respect uh, Premier Legault and I respect his comments uh, and, and I've, I've heard them uh, before. We had uh, good discussions uh, with respect to this. I disagree um, with the, the comments that he had made. The fact of the matter is, is this is, this is in the federal jurisdiction. The Constitution uh, says as much that that conversation, as I said, is playing its way, uh, making its way uh, through the courts with the first uh, decision being a unanimous decision that that is in fact the case. So. Um, Whoever is the, the leader of this nation after this fall's federal election, um, the, the, uh, they will have the responsibility if a proponent comes forward to uh, work uh, this through the system that we have. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Premier Mo. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Bessie. There was no discussion at all on a threat to national unity. There is more that is actually binding us together yes, than there is that's dividing us. Yes, we might uh, disagree uh, in the room, but we come out united. Thirteen premiers want to focus on one thing, creating well-paid jobs for Canadians. Uh, the level of frustration uh, and alienation that exists in Alberta right now towards Ottawa and the Federation is, I believe, at its highest level, certainly in our country's modern history. 
The 13 premiers don't agree on the state of the country's unity, not altogether, that is, nor is there consensus on pipelines despite wide support for an energy or an economic corridor. But they did agree on the need for provincial control over climate change plans. What can we read into the premier's stance? And what are the implications of this meeting for Justin Trudeau's federal government? It's time for the power panel in Toronto. Melissa Lansman of Hill and Knowlton Strategies, alongside former Saskatchewan Finance Minister Andrew Thompson, now Chief of Government Relations for the University of Toronto and in Montreal. We're joined by former Quebec Liberal Immigration and Environment Minister David Ertel. Hi, everybody. Great to see Hi, you. Hi, Vashi. Before we get going, in the interest of disclosure, Melissa, I have to ask you about a statement put out by Democracy Watch today. They sent a letter to Ontario's Integrity Commissioner, David Wake, asking him to issue a public ruling on whether there is a conflict of interest because you previously worked with the Ford campaign, you now at times lobby the Ford government. What's your reaction? Um, I sought advice from the commissioner. I have complied with all of that advice um, and uh, I'm in complete compliance with the rules. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the premiers. Andrew, I'll start with you. A lot of talk in that closing press conference not too long ago about whether or not the federal government should be put in a pipeline right through Quebec. Tons of questions for Premier Legault about his uh, opposition and, and how he says there is no social acceptability for oil. He did not seem to move. What do you make of that portion of the discussion? Well, Energy East is probably one of the most sensible pipeline projects that could be uh, developed. It's one that would feed uh, the refineries on the East Coast. It would allow us to have more Canadian control over uh, the refining process uh, of Canadian crude. I think it makes a lot of sense, but certainly the politics in Quebec are difficult. And it's interesting how uh, the Western provinces are not pushing harder for this because it doesn't, or for that matter, frankly, the Atlantic provinces aren't pushing harder for this because it's a made in Canada solution. I get the politics uh, in terms of Quebec and I understand the, you know, the general anti-pipeline politics that are there, but this is one that really could create jobs for Canadians and make sure that we had more control over the, uh, the use of that resource. David, help us understand Premier Legault and his, his insistence today that there just there's no social acceptability for that. Well, there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, you see François Legault evolving since he took power last October, because before uh, the holidays, he was talking, Quebecers don't want of this dirty oil. And now he's talking about social acceptability. And during the press conference, he said something very interesting. He referred to polls that were made during the time the Energy East project was alive. So the last polls that were taken in 2016, support in Quebec for Energy East was actually close to 50%. And since then, obviously, since the project was let go uh, by TransCanada Pipelines, there hasn't been really any polling. But François Legault here is, is more about playing politics here, and he even said it. He said there's a big political angle here. First of all, his campaign last October was about selling more hydropower to the, to the rest of Canada. And Doug Ford has said no, and there doesn't seem to be anything moving on that front. So he's trying to position himself in trying to sell more hydropower, but at the same time, he has approved two projects, two pipeline projects in Quebec. There's one, there's a gas pipeline project that's moving forward. It's not completely approved, but he's for it. And two, there's another, there's a, uh, an oil terminal in Montreal, which includes a seven kilometer pipeline that's been formally approved by the Legault government. So there's a lot of movement there. Plus, on top of that, federally speaking, you have now the star candidate for the Liberals for the next election in Quebec, Stephen Gilbo, who's the leading environmentalist who was against energies, who's now going to be a candidate for the Trudeau Liberals and now uh, trying to uh, try to find a way to explain why he's joining the Liberals who are for Trans Mountain. So there's a lot of evolution in Quebec right now going on. And Francois Legault is opening the door because he's saying if Quebecers supported via polls, well, then the social license is there. What do you think the implications, Melissa, are for the federal parties? And, and we've heard various references to it throughout that press conference from various premiers, but the idea that if Quebec does vocalize opposition to this, they have the authority to, you know, put a pipeline through there, but will any of them actually use it? And I, and I think the question is fair to all political parties. 
Uh, I, I agree with you. And, and whether they say they're not going to and then and then do so is a, is a completely different question. So how <laughs> they campaign and uh, and frankly what gets done afterwards uh, I think could be two different things in uh, uh, in this situation, be it the Liberals or uh, or the Conservatives. I think this raises a, a bigger question uh, around national unity and the conversations that I think you got a little bit uh, when when Premier Kenny um, uh, did the pre or did a presser with you afterwards, or a, an interview with you after the presser, where he was a he was a he was a bit exacerbated by Quebec's position. And I do agree with David that I think it's shifted a little bit, where now he's pointing um, and he's using the Quebec public as a, as a scapegoat to his position, because maybe you know maybe it is time for him to change his mind. But if those, like David said, Andrew, if those polls were to change, does this provide the cover now for Premier Legault to say, actually, the acceptability has improved or, or something along those lines? That's probably true. I think he's moving the goalposts a little bit, which is, is probably in the best interest of the country. Uh, it's good to see premiers be able to, to compromise on this. I think they are setting up for a, a longer uh, game and a bit more discussion about you know, what the quid pro quo is of, of this type of a trade-off. That's what we should be expecting from the premiers. We should be expecting them to w figure out uh, creative ways to work together to make sure provincial interests are recognized, but that the larger national interest is also protected. And what about you, David, as far as the implications for the federal campaigns go? You're, you're in there in Quebec, and I always wonder, we, uh, I think uh, Premier Kenny was saying, you know, Justin Trudeau's already said that he won't go against Quebec. Uh, and I, I was saying that I've asked the specific question of Andrew Scheer before, you know, are you willing to use that constitutional authority in Quebec? And he isn't very specific in his answers either. What kind of considerations do all the leaders have when they're asked that kind of a question? Well, I think there's a lot of brinksmanship going on here because François Legault uh, last week decided to join the provinces that are contesting the carbon tax. And to Andrew's point, I think uh, there's, there's a lot of negotiations behind the scenes going on. Federally speaking, uh, I think right now, Quebec, the election is very tight. There's a lot of swing ridings that are going to be in Quebec right now. Uh, a lot of three-way and four-way races go are going to be happening. And so I, right now in Quebec, there isn't a lot of debate on, on the national unity front. Actually, in Quebec, I mean, we were talking more about uh, the national unity debate being dead, actually, in Quebec. Uh, right now, I, I think it's less about national unity than the fact that, environmentally speaking, it's a shared jurisdiction between the federal government and the provinces. So it's not about imposing. It's about, and courts have recognized this, not only in Quebec, but in BC and in other uh, cases, where, where you're talking about environmental evaluations, even if it's a federal infrastructure project, provincial environmental laws apply for the evaluation. So as long as provinces can evaluate the project within their own jurisdiction, uh, it's not about imposing, it's about making sure that provincial law is respected. I guess Can I jump in on this. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Because one of the the challenges we have is with the way the uh, uh, the Council of the Federation is set up. It is set up really a, uh, to exacerbate that dynamic, where we end up with this polarization of approaches between the province and the federal government. I've always had a concern that this is really what is working against uh, kind of a broader national interest is that we don't have all 14 governments sitting down together. We have the group of the provinces, the 13 of them, and then separately acting the federal government. Until we get all the players at the table at the same time to talk about some of these issues, as we used to, uh, on environment issues, on uh, uh, major issues around energy, we're not going to really see these kind of solutions. In fact, what the politicians are doing is really punting it off to the courts uh, to make rulings that really should be sorted out politically. Well, well they do meet. I mean, they. I, I think it was in, I can't even remember when, but we were in Montreal not that long ago for the Premier's meeting with the with the Prime Minister then. But I, I take it. But they're not doing meeting. the hard yards of the work right. coming out of that. And that's ops. the piece. They're that's right. Ops. Okay, last word to you, Melissa. I think in terms of how the Council of Federation works, I, I agree with Andrew. I think the meetings are always the same. The communique is the same. It could have been written before the meeting started. Uh, it usually and, is. Probably yeah, is. And, and frankly, um, you know, if they make, uh, if they move the yardstick a little bit on some of the uh, interprovincial trade issues, I think that's a win for them because uh, for the first time they're talking about it. But in terms of, uh, you know, pipelines, uh, the carbon tax, things are, uh, pharmacare that are divisive amongst promise, uh, provinces, I, I think that this is more about a federal election looming uh, rather than getting any work done. Hi, I'm Vashi Capellos, host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link 
for another video. Thanks for watching.